Uh, hi, I thought it was a very interesting lecture. Um, could you just tell me what the difference is, if there is any difference, between dark matter particles and neutrinos? Yes. So ne neutrinos are another type of particle. They're very closely related to the normal particles that the everyday stuff is made out of. And neutrinos were, in fact, invented. This is an example of great success, actually, in just making stuff up. Because neutrinos were invented by particle physicists. They saw they, they were doing some a particular collision. That's what particle physics do. They just sort of smash stuff into other stuff. Uh, and they, they did some of that, and they saw that some results they didn't understand. And they said, OK, well, these results would make sense if there was a tiny, undetectable particle that was just flying away at the speed of light from our experiment, taking away a bit of mass, a bit of energy. Uh, and it sounded kind of crazy, but then later, people actually managed to detect these things directly. So it's, it's actually an example of where things really went right just by taking an idea and running with it. However, it sounds like neutrinos would be great for dark matter, right? They're almost undetectable, almost invisible, um, not quite. Unfortunately, there just cannot be enough of them to make up this five times more than, than the stuff that we know and love. Uh, so dark matter has got to be something else. <laughs> If I, if I knew the answer to that, I would be delivering this lecture in Sweden, <laughs> collecting my Nobel Prize. <laughs> Nobody knows. Dark matter seems to be invented um, so that gravity can work right, but why can't the laws of gravity themselves be like slightly changed instead of inventing this whole new matter thing? Yeah, so it's a very fair question. Why don't we just change the laws of gravity rather than invent new stuff? And the answer is that people have tried. So people have tried finding ways to change the laws of gravity so that you uh, are not seeing evidence for extra stuff. You're just doing your calculations wrong, basically. That, that's, uh, that's this idea. And it, it's perfectly fair enough because, you know, our idea of what gravity does it's largely based on experiments here on Earth, places like apple orchards and so on. And, um, and, and you, if you just take that and you scale it up to the size of the universe, it would be perfectly fair enough to go, well, maybe it just does something slightly different on those really large scales. However, however much people have tried, they haven't been able to explain all the different things that we see. Whereas dark matter pretty much has. That's not totally fair to say that dark matter answers all the mysteries about the way stuff behaves in the universe. But it does answer an awful lot of them just with that one idea that we've got this dark matter out there. Um, people have not been able to do that by changing the equations of gravity. So it's totally practical. It's just, it's just we're going, well, yeah, of course, you could change the laws of gravity. It's just nobody's worked out how to do it. And I suppose, in a sense, that's my point, uh, that... that it could be that this whole dark matter idea is wrong, but we've got to stick with the thing that is actually giving us results at the moment. Otherwise, we're just going to sit around going, well, um, it could be Lego bricks. or I mean, it, it's, just, it's just too many possibilities if you, if you allow yourself that. That's why we stick with pretty much with, with one idea, but it, it's possible. Um, how much space does dark matter take up to normal matter? So, like, you said that the dark matter can come through the walls, like, as if the walls weren't there. So, like, no matter how much stuff that, of place, um, or space that the normal matter takes up, dark matter just seems to be on its own <coughs> bit of stuff, even though that stuff is already occupied. So, how much stuff does it take up in considering about the normal mass stuff. So. That's, a, that's a really good way of looking at it. So one way you can think about how is it that dark matter can come through walls is by imagining that every little particle of dark matter is in fact itself incredibly tiny. We call, we, 
the, the, thing, the thing is, when we say how big, how big is uh, uh, a particle of, say, uh, I don't know, how big is a hydrogen atom, say, then we have a particular way of answering that, because when you get down to those very tiny scales, even questions like that are quite hard to answer. You have to be very, very clear about exactly what you mean. So we talk about something's cross-section, which basically means if you throw it, uh, if you, if you throw it at, say, say, a mesh, so if I create a little mesh to see what I can fit through, uh, then I throw a hydrogen atom at that mesh. Then how closely spaced does the mesh need to be before the hydrogen atom will bounce off? And that distance is what we base this idea of the cross-section on. Now, we can do the same for dark matter. And we say, dark matter has a cross-section too, so how finely spaced does your mesh need to be before dark matter bounces off it? And it turns out we don't know yet, because we haven't found it, but we do know it's got to be incredibly, incredibly fine much, much finer than for any other particle we know about. So you can take all of the other particles and throw them at something really, really finely spaced and they just won't fit through. Dark matter still will. So we don't know actually how much space a bit of dark matter takes up. Oh, oh right up at the top. Hello. Um, what would dark energy really need? What properties would it need? What properties would the... Um, mm -hmm atom or what particle need to be dark energy? Well, the, the thing about dark energy is we don't think it can be a particle because it has this property that it's creating, it seems to be creating energy to kind of push the universe apart faster and faster. And we don't know of particles that can do that. As far as we can tell, particles don't just don't behave in that way. So it, 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 you can't even really think of it like a particle. It's, more, it's even more abstract and weird than that. But we can say what properties it needs. And the, the properties are that if, if you could take, if you've got a box of dark energy, right? If I give you a box of dark energy, that's got a certain amount of energy trapped within it, associated with that dark energy. Just a certain amount, a number. And if I then uh, sort, of, sort of make the box a bit larger. So imagine I sort of have a, have, a, have a handle I can pull out so that the box gets larger. Then with normal particles, they just get more spread out through the box. So if I've got a certain amount of particles in here, a certain amount of air, and I, I make the box bigger, they just spread out and they go through it. So I've got the same total amount of stuff in there that I started off with. The thing that we need for dark energy is that if I do the same thing, so I have it in a box and then I make the box twice as big, then I end up with twice as much dark energy in the box as I started with, which is just not something that you can do with particles. So that's the property that it needs, but it's very, it's very abstract. <laughs> does, that, does that answer your question? <laughs> Um, it seems from your presentation the whole idea of dark matter is necessary if the measurement of matter in a galaxy from the light it's emitting is accurate. How sure are we that it, that measurement is actually accurate and not just wrong? Um, yeah, it's a great point. So, so I think what you're saying is, suppose, because uh, you, you see a certain amount of light coming from a galaxy, you need to convert that into how much stuff is actually there. It's like a conversion ratio, like swapping dollars for pounds or something. You're swapping light for total amount of stuff. And the, the question, if I understand correctly, is how certain is that conversion ratio? And the answer is that it's not very certain, actually. Um, people struggle with this, but we do think we've got it under control. And what I didn't have time to say is that there are actually examples of galaxies where there are virtually no stars in there. Um, there's just a bit of gas. And it turns out with gas, we are very, very good at going from what we can see and turning it into um, a total amount of gas. And in those galaxies, that's where we really, really start to believe this evidence that there has to be extra stuff because we don't have that uncertainty there. Um, so yes, it is worry, but we think we're on top of it. Well, I can't. I can't see. Yes, uh, one up there. Uh, if you look at dark energy, you really like the first time, and dark energy, it like feels like it, they're like so similar. 
The, the, the dark energy and the, and the what, sorry, is it similar? The dark matter, when you first think about it, it seems like dark matter and dark energy are like so similar. Oh, I see, yes. Well, they, they are very similar in a way. No, they, they're both things that we can't see and that we've just, can't, we've just invented <laughs> to, to make things sort of seem to add up a bit better. Um, but they... But we do know that they have to be different things because they, they do slightly different things to the universe. So um, although they, they do have a lot in common, we do have to be clear that they are different things. They do both say dark. They do both say dark, yeah. <laughs> oh, where's, the, where's the next one? There's uh, Deborah's one over there. Hello. Hello, yeah. So if you've got these millions and millions and millions and part of dark particles, dark, dark matter particles streaming through this room and going out the other side of the Earth. Um, if dark matter particles obey gravity, then have we got dark matter particles in orbit? I mean, are they, are they with us? Because um, if they obey gravity, then you think they would be. Yeah, um, the, the, you're absolutely right. I mean, so dark matter particles can go into orbit. However, around, say, the Earth, they don't really. And the reason is that this is all, of course, if we're doing the calculations correctly, which I, I hope I've sort of shown you there is some room for doubt. But assuming that we're doing this right, um, we don't think they're in orbit around the Earth. And the reason is that they are approaching the Earth at about 100 kilometers a second. That's very fast indeed. It's far, far faster than the speed that you need to totally escape from the Earth's gravity. So they certainly feel the Earth's gravity as they come through, but they've got so much speed to start with that the Earth is unable to really capture them. However, what people do think and, and do calculations of is that something much bigger like the sun might be able to capture a significant amount of dark matter. I mean, not, not a huge amount compared to the sun itself, but the gravity of the sun is that bit stronger. So it may be that right at the centre of the sun, there is a certain build-up of dark matter. And they get the speed from, we don't know. Yeah, well, so the speed, the speed comes from these computer simulations of what happens to dark matter, uh, where, we, uh, where, we, where we build something that looks very much like our own galaxy, and then we can go in and say, all right, in, in our virtual universe, of course, we know everything. We, we're like gods. It's brilliant. Uh, we can go in and we can find out exactly what's happening to all the dark matter in there. And we do see that there's this uh, large speed at which um, the dark matter tends to be approaching stars. So that's what that is based on. And as I said, that's a sort of general pattern rather than something very specific. And that's why we kind of trust it more than we would if we were just trying to say, well, what happens to this particular bit of dark matter? Uh, over here? Uh, uh, why have you called it dark matter? If you can't see it, so you don't know why it's it, if you don't know that it's dark. Yeah, that's a, it, was, it was pretty bad to say. What would you call it? Invisible matter. <laughs> I, I think we can all get behind that, yeah. I, um, unfortunately, um, people just make up names for things. And once they've made up a name, it sort of sticks, it's quite hard. So if I were to go into my, uh, into my work tomorrow and I were to write something in uh, a scholarly magazine about invisible matter, then all the people around the world would go, what? what's invisible matter? So once somebody's called it dark matter, unfortunately it's too late. It's really hard to rename it after that. But I agree with you, it should be called invisible matter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. Up here, up here. Uh, yeah, hello. <laughs> All right, sorry, I've got two questions, basically. Um, the first one is about a pattern of the black matter you're talking about, because what you said it's um, running around towards the center of the galaxy, but what we know that the center of the galaxy is a black hole, and the black hole is supposed to have a very strong gravitational force there. And follow up the question, you just uh, laid it down there, asked you about uh, whether we can capture it. I think. Uh, Black hole should be have a strong enough force to capture it. But if it did get into the black, uh, if the if the dark matter did get into the black hole, where did they go? Or did they just pass through it, or they disappear, or they not affected by the black hole at all? This is the I mean, just yeah, how how the black hole and the dark matter fit together? I mean, 
this is the first question. Second question is a little bit silly, probably, is if I, if I now walk out of this building and point of a star in the sky without any device, just using my eyes, how do I know it's a galaxy or it's a star? All right, so I'm going to take your second question first, um, because it's a bit easier. If you go out tonight and look at the sky and you see something, uh, it's definitely a star, because you will not see galaxies from within London. Uh, <laughs> galaxies are really, really faint, <laughs> not, not because they're actually dim, but just because they're a really, really long way away. Um, so you do need a telescope. Really, I mean, Andromeda, which is the closest galaxy to us, you can just see with the unaided eye, but it needs to be a really dark night, and you need to be in a really dark place, and your eyes need to adjust. So, um, yeah, uh, anything that you see with your naked eye pretty much is going to be a star. Now, your first question was about black holes at the center of galaxies. And it's absolutely right that we do now think, we've got some really good evidence, whole other topic, that there are black holes at the center of galaxies. And they are very good at capturing things. If you throw something into a black hole, it is not going to come out again. And so you're absolutely right that if, if a piece of dark matter gets fired right into a black hole, it will not come out. Um, it just disappears in, gets eaten up, the black hole gets a bit bigger. It's the same thing that happens to normal matter. We have no reason to think dark matter is any different. The reason it doesn't matter too much for the stuff that I was talking about is that actually black holes are really very tiny compared to galaxies. So even if you're talking about stuff going right towards the center of a galaxy, it needs to be incredibly well um, aligned. It needs to be going at exactly the right angle towards the center of the galaxy to get to what is actually a very tiny black hole. Um, so most dark matter just kind of goes past the edge of the black hole, and, and that's absolutely fine, of course. So we don't actually think black holes eat all that much dark matter. Ah, uh, we've got another one. I'm trying to remember who we... Uh, over there, somewhere. Yep. Um, so what's the difference between dark matter and antimatter? Yeah, dark, so antimatter is, is stuff that's very closely related, a bit like neutrinos, very closely related to normal matter that, that is familiar to us. In fact, it's, a, it's almost like a mirror image of normal matter. For every um, normal particle that we are used to having around us, there is a theoretical antiparticle, which is... Um, if you like, it's a sort of a mirror image of the, of, of, the, of the normal particle. And those things are absolutely known to exist. There's, n there's no question about it. You cannot make sense of the stuff that's going on, say, at the Large Hadron Collider, for example, unless you uh, include antimatter in the calculations. And what's more, people have actually created antimatter. They've even stored antimatter. The only thing we haven't done with antimatter so far is blown up the Vatican. Um, but uh, I don't think there are any plans uh, to do that. But, you know, who can tell? So, so antimatter is absolutely, definitely real. Dark matter is much more doubtful. I mean, personally, I do actually think it's probably real. But, but it's much more doubtful. We haven't been able to make it. It's a completely different type of particle rather than just a sort of mirror image of one of the normal particles that we know about. Uh, with, econof with econophysics, um, how do they work out numbers from people throwing money at each other? How do they get the graph? It's based, so, so really where the number comes from is you, you start off by assuming there is a certain amount of money to start with. So if you, you assume there's a total amount of money, and then you imagine people are just throwing it around at random. And you apply um, a, a formula known as maximum entropy. That's the technical name of what's going on here. Uh, and it basically says what you're going to end up with if, if people really just throw this stuff around is the most random thing that you could possibly end up with. And believe it or not, you can take something that sounds a bit vague like that and turn it into a mathematical equation. Um, this has been actually you know, proved from axioms in a very mathematically rigorous way. Um, and, uh, and that's what maximum entropy is all about. And it works incredibly well within physics. 
about how energy gets divided between different particles and so on. So this was just a sort of leap of faith and going, well, maybe it tells you how money gets divided between people, and it kind of does. We know that we have matter and antimatter. We have dark matter. Do we have anti-dark matter? <laughs> uh, the, the answer to that is, it depends. <laughs> for, for, for our best... So, Particle physicists do play around with the equations of particle physics and try and work out, okay, how could we take the equations that we know and love that, that tell us what particles there are and extend them uh, uh, to, to, try and, um, to try and come up with um, uh, some, something that includes dark matter as well as all the stuff that we actually know exists. And for the, the best guess they have at how to do that, then dark matter is actually its own antiparticle, uh, which sounds, sounds a bit weird, uh, but that is actually possible within particle physics. Um, so for the, for the, best, uh, uh, pos the best possible model they've got, then there isn't really such a thing as anti-dark matter. Um, but, you know, until we actually know what it is, who knows? Yep? If there's so many particles, uh, dark matter particles, flying through everywhere, why can't we see, like, the interactions with normal matter particles and say, oh, there's a dark matter particle. Oh, no, it's gone. But, I mean, there it was, and why can't we see that? Well, that is exactly what people are trying to do. So... Uh, people have built experiments to try and do exactly that. And they build enormous vats. I think we're up to um, is it about a tonne now. A very, very pure... It turns out Xenon is very good at this for, for reasons which I'm definitely not going to go into now. But the, the idea with those things is exactly what you say, that a dark matter particle comes through. If it hits an atom of Xenon, you should be able to see... Uh, that that's happened. And that is precisely what people are trying to do. They, they build big, I think it's a ton, a ton of xenon now, and they sit there and they watch it to see, does it, does it get disturbed? And they sit there, and they sit there, and they sit there. And it's very boring, because absolutely nothing happens, as far as we can tell so far. But that doesn't mean that dark matter's not there. The, the trouble is... As I said, dark matter doesn't feel the normal forces that we do. So for it to be able to hit something, that does involve a force. So it, 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 needs, to, it needs to feel some sort of force. So what we know is that it only feels a very tiny amount of force. And so it's very, very hard to get it to do that. Or to, to go back to the question earlier on about how big is a dark matter atom. Another way you can think about the same thing is just imagine that the dark matter particles are very, very tiny. So it's very easy for them to, to zip between all the xenon that's in your tank. So it, that's the same physics explained in two different ways. Uh, so, yeah, so far, absolutely nothing. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's nothing to be found, but we're trying. Uh, we, oh, okay, yeah, go on. Um, yeah, going back to that meshy thingy, my bobby, um, with the, there's a theory called supersymmetry, isn't there, where it's that the particles are more than one TeV or something which is significantly more than the existing particles that we know exist in the standard model. Um, so surely they would be bigger. So why do they pass through the mesh so they're smaller? So what? Well, so first of all, you're absolutely right that supersymmetry is, is exactly what the particle physicists think could explain dark matter. It does predict all these extra particles. Um, and you're right that a lot of those particles are, are very massive indeed. Uh, it, I think a TV might be pushing it a bit, but 100 GV would be fine. And um, the, the, the thing is that in particle physics, mass doesn't have to go with size. Or, or to put it another way, um, it doesn't mass and how much something feels forces are two separate things. They just appear completely separately in the equations. So you can kind of tune them separately from each other. So you can actually have something that's really got loads of stuff there, but yet it's very tiny. Um, so it, this is part of the weird world of quantum mechanics. Um, but yeah, I, I, I hope that answers it. I mean, it's, it's just that these two things are, are different. 
uh, in reference to dark matter, uh, like you see how it just goes really fast at really fast speeds. Isn't it anywhere where it starts? Like anywhere where it stops? Yeah, no, starts, doesn't oh, start starts. Oh, starts. Because, you know, it has to build up the speed. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I have kind of edged around this whole question, well, where does everything start, right? I, I think I, I've kind of not said anything about that. I uh, showed you how galaxies form, but I didn't say, well, where, where do all these things start? And where does the dark matter start? It turns out, actually, we have a really great theory uh, for what was going on in the very first few moments of the universe. Um, it's something called inflation, and the best way I can describe it is that it's even more made up than dark energy. <laughs> um, it, it, it's totally made up. I mean, it's, it's crazy stuff. Um, but what's remarkable about that is uh, it makes predictions again for what the early universe would have looked like. And we can compare those predictions to a kind of record we've got of the early universe in something called the cosmic microwave background. I, I, I really don't want to start explaining that, but you can go and look it up. It, it's a record of the early universe, and it agrees very well with this idea called inflation. So that gives us a sort of a, a way of thinking about what was the early universe like. And basically, everything was very evenly spread out. And so the reason dark matter ends up going very fast when it's in our galaxy is actually our galaxy started out as this enormous thing spread out over very, very large regions. And then because of gravity, everything was pulled together. And so by the time it gets to what we now call the galaxy, it's going very fast. And it, and it doesn't really have any way to get rid of all that speed that it's got. So it just carries on, you know, looping around the galaxy. Uh, and, and that's our current theory of, of the way that galaxies form. Does that answer the question? Yeah. I think there was one, there was one up the top, which I keep yeah. forgetting. Hello. Um, so I, I guess this question has been slightly undermined by the whole um, supersymmetry thing. But um, it's more to do with dark matter. That you, you said it was like five times more than than we, than we see from the light. Um, so that, that must be like a vast amount of maths that, that we're talking about. But then, yeah, each sort of particle, you say, is really, really small. And then, and I guess sort of like the neutrinos, how can something so small, how can there be enough that it adds up to such a vast amount? Yeah, I mean, I think it is, it is partially the same question as, as down here, right? That, that, um, that you... You know, you're, you're, you're taking something, yes, it's very tiny, but uh, that, w when we say something is tiny, we just need to be very clear about what do we mean by it being tiny. And what we mean is uh, it's packed into a very small space, if you like. It's, it's very hard for us to actually catch hold of it because it tends to just go through things. Um, and it's just, it's just true about the way that particle physics is put together that that doesn't mean that there can't be very much of it in there. If the, if, if, it can be very small, but have an awful lot of stuff in there. And then you take an awful lot of these tiny things uh, and uh, you can quite, quite quickly add those up to be a large amount of mass when you've just got a lot of them. <laughs> go, go, go ahead. Uh, I've got two questions. The first one is, if we made up dark matter almost and dark energy, can we compare them to an imaginary number like the square root of minus one? And also, um, are there any other laws of physics that dark matter does obey? Yeah, well, you know what? I've never thought about it like that, but uh, that's a really nice way of thinking about it. You know, in maths is, is uh, they're lucky in a way, right? Because you, you can make up an idea in maths. And as long as you're sort of consistent about it, as long as you don't do anything that's against the rules, then it's fine. It becomes part of maths. Um, and so, yes, we are doing something very similar. We're, we're making something up. The difference, though, is that in physics, we have to go and test against the real world. And eventually, if we can't show that what we're saying is true is also happening in the real world, then we're in a bit of trouble in a way that the mathematicians don't have to worry about. So it is a very, it's a very nice parallel, though. And the, and the second, I've completely forgotten the second question now. <laughs> Oh, well, yes, right, other, other laws of physics. 
Yes, I mean, there, there are really important laws of physics like conservation of energy and other things like conservation of momentum that you might have heard of. Dark matter certainly obeys those, or at least in the way that we've made it up, it does. Um, the, the, the trouble is, if it didn't obey things like that, then we couldn't even do this argument where we say, well, the patterns are going to come out about right. Because that's all based on things. I mean, remember when I was talking about the pendulum, I was talking about energy. If you don't have things like conservation of energy anymore, then even at that very basic level, you can't make predictions. So you run into real problems very fast. So we do need it to obey most of the laws of physics that we're familiar with. Um, so, the sort of main thing... Hi. Where are you? Here. Oh, you're there. Hello. The, the sort of main thing that I'm going to take away from tonight is that dark matter particles are very different from ordinary particles. Um, but that sort of, um, sort of struck a question in my mind. Um, you know, could we incorporate these dark matter particles into the standard model that we know of? Or are we going to have to scrap that theory entirely and make a new one? Like, is there a dark model of particle physics or something? Yeah, the, the answer to that is the particle physicists, bless them, they're trying very hard. Uh, they're, they're, uh, the, the, the trouble is almost that there's too much freedom. If you say, all right, we want something which has all the normal particles, but it also has these weird dark particles as well. Um, then there are actually loads of different ways you can do that. It's no longer the standard model, because by definition, when we say the standard model of particle physics, we just mean the, the, the model of the particles that we already definitely know about. Um, so by definition, that's no longer the standard model, but it sort of extends the standard model. It's adding stuff on to it, bolting it on the side. And the real problem that they've got is they just have so many different ways of doing that and getting these extra types of particles that, 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 that it's, it's too much choice in a way. You know, the, the, there are literally dozens of different ways you can do it. Uh, and until we actually find one of the particles and can say, you know, we've got it in the lab, we know it has these properties, we just, we just won't know. So it's the very last question, I think. Yeah. Hi. Actually, I just want to know, I was wondering, is it possible to add extra dimensions to dark matter properties? Certainly people have, have looked at adding extra dimensions to the universe. Um, if you've heard of something called string theory, uh, it's all about that. It's about saying, well, you know, the three dimensions of space are all very well, but let's add a few more and see what happens. And it turns out that that's a really interesting mathematical idea that can give you lots of kind of ideas about what might this, it comes back to the same point in a sense. It comes back to how might you extend what we understand as the standard laws of particle physics at the moment. That's what it boils down to. Doing this um, is just a very specific way of going beyond physics that we know about today. Um, the trouble with that idea is so far, um, although it's been a lot of fun for a lot of mathematicians, they haven't been able to show how the standard model, that is the stuff that we know and love today, that we can experiment on now, they haven't shown exactly how that comes out of the maths of all these extra dimensions and strings and so on, let alone used it to make uh, really good predictions for what should the properties of dark matter be. So it, it's a... It's an idea that a lot of people are following. Um, at the moment, we don't know whether it's going to lead us anywhere. And I think with that, I've, I've got to stop. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I know it is sad. It is sad. Uh, if you want, please come and find me. Um, I'm very happy to talk within reason. I'm sure we'll eventually get kicked out of the room. Um, but uh, I just want to say thank you very much for listening tonight, and thank you for coming.